for this equation, and that has to do with fracking and the industry's exemption from the Clean Water Drinking Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Maybe mixing them, flipping a few words in those acts. So that is related to what some of you may have heard of as the, the Halliburton loophole. I'll try and hold this properly here. All right, so uh, let me just maybe kind of throw a couple more comments on that. The A water report just came out that um, follows what Paul was just telling you is the idea that these deep water, um, deep fracking sites are going to get into the groundwater is actually not the major issue we should be thinking about. Uh, and it is a fairly rare occurrence to happen. If you just look at the geology, it tells you that. But also a report just came out this month for um, northeastern Weld County and a couple of the counties to the east showing 20 well sites that they looked at. None of them had any evidence of fracking types of materials in that well water. Um, I, I'll talk to you about a couple of other things that I think are bigger issues. Um, but first of all, let me just ask you, what kind of expertise would you want to hear from today to try and understand the impacts of fracking? Yell it out. Geology. Geology, good. Air. Air, atmospheric sciences. Safety. Safety. <laughs> what else? Health. Yes, medical. medical, health, good. Water. Okay. Water. <laughs> A hydrologist of some kind, right? Okay, so I'm a plant ecologist. <laughs> Don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I made this little handout that's kind of going around to try and at least focus you on why a plant ecologist would care about what's happening with fracking and the impact of fracking on various sites. And we focused our research on the Pawnee National Grasslands and really uh, I'm a disturbance ecologist. I like to understand how various disturbances impact communities, how they respond to those. Can we restore them? Can we reclaim them? All those wonderful kinds of questions around plants. So that's kind of the uh, angle we came at with this. Uh, in addition to that, we we're very interested in the volatile organic compounds that were potentially coming off these sites, especially in relation to their impacts for ozone, which has very significant effect on plants, um, but also anything else as far as going up the food chain. So were those volatile organic compounds actually within the plants or on the plants, uh, the cows then eating those or whatever else eating those and it goes up the food chain and potentially becomes part of what is in our diet or at least is in the diet of the animals that are on these Pawnee National grasslands. So that's really what the angle that we were coming at. And we were focused then on those two main things. Um, do we see any volatile organic compounds coming off of these sites? Uh, and are these sites that have been abandoned and reclaimed, are they anywhere similar to the native uh, Pawnee National grasslands that we have? So those are the two big questions we had, and we went after those. Just briefly, to try and tell you a little bit about those, um, we started with trying to determine exactly whether the volatile organic compounds that we were witnessing were truly from oil and natural gas or whether they were from some other kind of industry or transportation. <clears throat> there are ways of telling that based on the chemicals that are there. Um, so the one little first diagram that I give you there as you roll around that sheet is looking at the I-pentane and pentane ratio. And if that ratio is high enough, then that suggests that it's from the petroleum, or oil and natural gas industry, and if it's the opposite, it's from uh, transportation industry. So we were fairly easily and clearly showing that the volatile organic compounds that we were seeing off these sites were definitely from oil and gas, natural gas. Now let me clarify that <laughs> the sites we were at were much smaller than this. Uh, they're small little uh, maybe 100 meters across. Uh, they have pump jacks on them usually. Uh, some do, some don't. But they're much smaller units that we were looking at. And basically we were trying to understand the volatile organic compounds in the immediate area, or point source kinds of compounds. So we are taking data about 25 meters from the pump jack itself in most cases. The other thing we noticed when we were out there is you can smell it, you can feel it because you get headaches. Um, so it was clear to us when we were just working around these sites that it made a difference if the pump jack was going or not. So is it actually pumping up oil and natural gas? So we also looked at that, and that's that second little graph you have, um, which clearly shows that if this, the site is pumping, there's much higher volatile organic compounds coming off that site. In addition to that, we actually looked at 
how many um, how much petroleum oil and natural gas was being produced over the last month compared to how many VOCs we were getting off of those sites and there was a clear relationship there too so the more production that's going on on these sites the more um, emissions are going they typically call those fugitive emissions um, they're from leaks, they're from the natural just flaming, uh, flaring, uh, all kinds of potential ways of uh, these volatile organic compounds. So um, the next stage to that was trying to understand uh, the restoration. So plugged in abandoned wells. Maybe we'll go back a little bit and tell you what really happens on some of these well sites to begin with. Much smaller, again. Um, but on the Pawnee National Grasslands, what they'll do is scrape it clean. They'll take all that topsoil and they'll set it off to the side because they're going to put it back later. And then they put a mat down to try and control for any spillage to go down into the soil. And then they lay their gravel down, put up, and do all their prep. When they're done, they pull all that off, cap the, um, the pipes that they had there, um, put the topsoil back, and revegetate. Now, the state of Colorado really doesn't have very high standards for revegetating. Um, they're hoping for 80% of the native cover. And native cover on short grass step is about 60%. <laughs> so if you get 50% cover, you're good. Um, they sign you off, and the restoration is great. Usually, they wait about five years to make sure that that process has had a chance. So we went back and looked at some of these sites that were plugged and abandoned um, and found that one, um, plenty of cover on these sites, and in some cases, more cover than you had on natural grasslands. Uh, two, the number of exotics were not necessarily greater than what you get in a normal situation, so it wasn't um, a problem there, except when the exotics were actually used for the planting in the seed mix. So there's one site we came across which was kind of interesting. Um, the road that was going to the site and the site itself were entirely planted with um, crested wheatgrass, agrippina, crustatum. Um, it was perfectly outlined. You could see it. This was a 35-year-old site, and you could see exactly the outlines of the well pad itself and the road. So uh, revegetating with exotic plants, that's going to be a problem. Um, but they almost never do that now. So everything that I've seen um, more recently with the restoration has been in pretty good shape. Um, as far as getting the full structure and the full community diversity back, um, you're, I'm showing you some diversity uh, on another graph there. Um, that is a little bit more of an issue. So the estimate from, from both our work and from work up in Wyoming is that that's about an 80 year process. So if you wait 80 years, you can get it back. So the good news is you can get it back, right? So if you think about some forms of energy, um, uh, solar fields, wind farms, those are rather permanent structures. Um, but in the case of uh, oil and natural gas, we do have the potential to take some of that land back. Okay, so I think that gets at most of my points. People would like to have questions. Yeah. Then you got this glass and other cover on the top. So that land is basically unusable for any other purpose. Would that be correct? Because you could crack those pipes and dig it up, then you would suddenly expose these compounds again to the air? Or? So I think we in Colorado have learned that pipes are a problem. <laughs> um, yeah, so if they have issues and if they degrade over time, then you can get some problems with those. And I, I guess one of the scary things that we saw with our data is that regardless of whether we are actually on a well pad or what we can call control sites, which were plugged and abandoned or even had never been um, ever a well pad, we had fairly high levels of these volatile organic compounds. So one, um, plugged in abandoned wells are known to leak, uh, and two, it really doesn't matter because we're basically breathing this crap everywhere, um, not just at the well sites. So the, the major pollution haze we have here along the front range, um, the latest study that came out this summer, the other little figure I gave you there from Froppy and uh, NCAR and the group that did all the flybys and everything. Um, 30 to 40 percent of that is from the oil and gas industry. 30 to 40 percent of that is from transportation. So around 70 to 80 percent 
is from those two major endeavors on the front range, which creates a higher pollution right here, which is bad for the plants. Just to get back. Um, so a concern that I have around the, the well casings is with um, Dr. Tony Ingraffia's work that has said that 5% of the time well casings fail immediately. So, and he said within 30, 50 years, all well casings, all that concrete that's supposed to be protecting the water, protecting you know, the fumes from coming into the air, um, the surrounding groundwater, will all fail by his research. And as I said, he says 5% of the time, it fails immediately. And so I'm, I'm concerned, I mean, I don't think that it's as clear cut as that it, it will, you know, just because, I, basically, I don't think that we can count on those well casings and that eventually all of these are going to be toxic waste zones, every single well case, every single well site. And I was just wondering, you know, if that's something that you all are concerned about. Sure. If, um, if you cannot reclaim it as being uh, negative forever, then that's certainly a concern to, to anyone. A couple of things to think about there. One is we've had this huge influx, so it's a numbers game to me that I try and play in my mind. We've been fracking for, I don't know, 50, 60 years, on the Pawnee at least. Um, I told you about that well study. So far, it doesn't seem like that's getting into the groundwater. But the more and more of those we do, the more and more likely it is, right? So this huge influx we've had over the last five years is a concern because we don't really know what's happening with these 50 years down the road, right? We don't have that data. Um, so it's not to say that it's not an issue. Uh, it's to say that um, so far so good, I guess, uh, in that relationship. But um, as, as far as I can tell on the Pawnee National Grasslands, things, to be, things seem to be being put back in a way that is conducive for them continuing as a grassland system. Do you a little concerned yeah. if these volatile organic compounds are going up the food chain? Um, are you aware of any studies or, or are there any results that might point to that and how it could maybe affect you? The best study I've seen for immediately adjacent to well pads is in Canada where they were showing cows with um, mouth lesions and nasal lesions and problems with respiratory, all kinds of issues like that. And that's partly what gave us the idea that we should be looking at that. Um, I don't know of any studies in Colorado. Uh, there's a tons of studies on health stuff that we'll hear about later, I hope, in regard to adjacency to wells for humans, at least, and respiratory issues, asthma especially. Um, so yeah, that's... Yeah, from what I've oh, read... Sorry, Sharon oh, was next. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I was wondering, you, you said that a lot of these compounds are just sort of everywhere in yeah. the environment. And so is there, what's the relationship with proximity or is there one? I think it's a concentration relationship. So when we were looking at the well sites on one of our studies, we were just 25 meters away taking the data. On the other study, we did it at 25, 50, and 100 meters away. There were two different ways of collecting the data. So the second one with the different distances was actually looking, we took the plants themselves, brought them into the lab and looked at how many volatile organic compounds came off of those. And in that situation, we didn't see a real strong distance effect. Uh, there's a lot of variability in the data because wind direction makes a difference as well. And you should understand about these volatile organic compounds that their turnover is very quick. Some of them last maybe 12 hours, others 24 hours. So if you have a problem, um, then it's usually because there's a continuous um, foot of this stuff and it's landing on the plants. Not that it's been there for years or anything like that. So because of all that variability, <laughs> we were having trouble with determining if there was a distance effect, which is a little scary in and of itself because most of those 100 meter plots were clearly in grazing land. Um, and they were having these high values of, of VOCs as well. Especially fancy. Yeah, uh, okay. I've read that the um, fracking done 50 years ago you referred to wasn't done with the VOCs, it was done with water. And I don't know when the VOCs kind of became a part of it with the little special recipe, but it's maybe 20 years, so I don't think we know the long term. And as far as the radioactive materials that they find in the mixture, I believe the half-life of a lot of radioactive materials is, what, 25,000 years? So I don't know about it being like just a short-term thing. So just those two things. Those two things, okay. 
So um, let me take the radioactive part first. Okay. We have a major radioactive problem regardless of where we are in well, Colorado. Add that to it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this does bring up more radiation, and we did not actually look at that. Um, certainly it's an issue, and I would say it's especially an issue for people working on these sites. Um, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't look at it. So that's their half-life true is much longer than what we're talking about there. So what radiation, what effect that has is definitely another factor. What was your first question? Yeah, uh, I've read that the fracking 50 years ago oh, right. that we refer to didn't have the VOCs, yeah. it was just water. So the chemicals were different for sure, or, yeah. but the VOCs are actually coming from the natural gas um, stuff themselves, not necessarily just from those chemicals we're putting down in there. So um, that those um, things like ethane, for example, are part of the natural gas component of those systems, so that's coming up with that, and that's one of the major VOC issues. That, that so you're saying that the, they're not uh, the VOCs that they put into the compounds are not. Um, it's both. It may be increasing. Okay, I was but kind it's of not, more addressing. It's not just that there weren't any back then. Oh right, That's but what I was addressing the ones that have been added since then. So it's yeah. it's different. Than oh, it is different. There's a lot of chemicals different. Right. It's different in different wells. It's different in different states. I mean, yeah. California has much different rules right. than we have. Secret and recipes. Yeah. Secret recipes are actually getting worse. Right. No yeah. doubt. Smaller sites. Yeah. Uh, are there any studies or future studies that will have more of a higher density of fracking area? So her question is uh, small sites versus big sites. Do we have any good studies on big sites? And yes, we do. There are tons of them actually. Um, I would say Pennsylvania has done a really good job of trying to determine the effects of, of fracking. New York, you know, has banned fracking now. Um, so several other areas have. The report I was mentioning earlier that came out um, July of this year, um, that's FRAP and NCAR and all those folks all together trying to look at um, these sites. Not only did they do the flyovers, but they also did drive-bys with canisters. And what they showed, which other studies have shown as well, are we have these super emitter sites that put out a lot. And um, you can list those, which ones are the worst. Uh, the problem, of course, from all these studies is you can't predict. It's impossible to predict which the super emitters are going to be. So you end up with them and that's what you've got. Um, but if you look at the quantities that they have off of these sites with their drive-bys of some of these larger well places like this um, around the Denver area and up in this area as well, um, their numbers are fairly similar to the numbers we got off our small site. Um, it's about two parts per million of benzene. So it's really high. and it's. It's an issue.